The motion picture you are about to see was filmed by four teams of cameramen in more than 120 locations around the world. Scientists representing more than 40 museums and research centers took part in the explorations. There are no actors in the film. Every location is real. The facts that will be presented are true. This may be the most startling and controversial film you'll ever see. They have been to Earth and left their mark in many ways, in many places. Figures etched on the plain of Nazca tell a story of explorers from outer space. The secret of the story has been learned. The visitors have been here. They have been described in many ways by many men, from primitive drawings to detailed histories, since the beginning of man's stay on Earth until this day. In the Andean mountains of South America, on the deserts of Egypt, in the temples of India, on islands in the Caribbean, the evidence is clear. The record of visits dates back more than 500 centuries. The observations of the planet continue even today. Monuments to the visitors that were created thousands of years ago have been found. They are tributes to the gifts brought from outer space. What has been unexplainable can now be explained. The brief glimpses of visitors provide a clue to their purpose and the reason for their coming. Every law of probability proves that other life exists in the universe. It is now possible to understand how life could have been transported to Earth from some distant planet. It is now possible to understand how we are connected to outer space. A remarkable prophecy etched in stone predicts the year and the day on which the visitors will return to stay. Will we be prepared for the moment that is soon to come? To travel successfully in deep space, man would have to hold the secret of his most precious dream, immortality. Distances are so vast that the spark of life must burn for eons to assure the successful transport of life from one galaxy to another. In ancient crypts, it is possible to find suggestions that the secret was known that a process of sustaining life was once available on Earth. X-rays of mummies thousands of years old indicate that they were encased at very young ages. Most were no more than 20 years old. The Curlian Aura.
You were witnessing the strange as yet unexplained event called the Carillion Effect. Its presence has been suspected for years. Only recently could the living spark be photographed. Fingertips and all living things generate a dynamic, constantly changing aura that sometimes sparks and leaps like a flame. How it works is something we simply do not know. At UCLA, Dr. Thelma Moss explores the strange world of Curlian photography. Uh, let's say that there are about six different words that we can describe for this effect, depending on who you are. If you are a conventional physicist, you will call it a corona discharge. And that means it's an electrical emanation caused by the current and the voltage going through the object. Some people who are more inclined to the occult or to the mystical will call it an aura. And they will compare, for example, in famous paintings, whether it's of Buddha or Jesus or Mohammed or anywhere around the world, there are these auras that are circling around the head. And they would like to believe that what we are photographing with this electrical photography is a representation of that, something invisible to the eye, but which exists in and around the body. That's another word. Then if you want to be sort of non-committal, as I prefer to be, I would call it an emanation or some uh, outpouring of an energetic thing. The Russians call this energetic thing by a technical name, bioplasma. Her laboratory is a sealed, light-proof chamber where the mysterious force can actually be seen. Triggered by an electrical current, the flaming halos that burst from objects exposed to the curling effect will be captured on high-speed film. An ancient marine creature that died 450 million years ago displays the residue of an ancient life force. Oh, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? What do you think that was? Okay, here's a very healthy and vigorous plant, and I am going to take a leaf from it. And what I'm going to do here is cut off one good, healthy section of it like that. And when I do, I'm going to place it on the glass electrode here so that you can see very clearly where the leaf has been cut. Is that good for you, Clark, for framing? Okay. Now, when we turn on the Curlian apparatus, I think, hopefully, hopefully, that we will see in outline the part of the leaf that has been cut away. We call that the phantom leaf effect. And after a moment, it is there, the aura of the full leaf. Okay, Arlene and Fred, would you step over on each side of that glass plate. Put your fingers on the back. I'm going to turn the power source on. Get very close to each other, but not touching. Very good. Now, do you feel that? Okay, fine. Does that feel comfortable for you? Fine. Good. Now, would you lean across to each other and start kissing, and please make it a passionate embrace, okay? <laughs> yeah, sure. Use hands. Use anything you can. Go to it. Fine. I think you can work up a little more enthusiasm. It looks to me as though maybe Arlene is having a little more fun than Fred. Can you get more into it, Fred? It looks like it's pretty good. You can have any kind of fantasies you like.
life force responds to an emotional experience. Okay, that looks just fine. What is it we're looking at in Curlian photography? And up to this moment in time, nobody knows. Whatever is seen in Curlian is seemingly immortal and possibly universal. In the mummy's hand, we find a life spark, thousands of years old. The mummification techniques developed by the Egyptians preserve the bodies of their royal dead for more than 4,000 years. But even that is but an eye blink of time when immortality is considered. Every so often, a hint that immortality is possible is reluctantly given by nature. Recently, at the bottom of the earth, an international team of scientists plunged their drills deep beneath the surface of the Antarctic continent. The goal was to probe the geologic history of Antarctica. Four hundred and twenty feet beneath the surface of McMurdo Station, Dr. Roy Cameron touched immortality. In a pinch of earth from the Antarctic depths, Dr. Cameron has found what is unquestionably the oldest living thing ever to inhabit the earth. After spending millennia freeze-dried in the cold rocks of Antarctica, a colony of bacteria reawakened in the warmth of the laboratory. The rocks from which they have come may be as much as one million years old. The ancient bacteria, never before seen by man, are once again growing and reproducing a million years after they first came into existence. Immortality is possible. Immortality, or something resembling it, is necessary when we consider the vast distances of space that must be crossed to plant life elsewhere in the cosmos. Somewhere in space, there is life. But where? A man counting a number every second of every working day would need a lifetime merely to reach the number one billion, a figure which falls 100 times short of the number of stars in our galaxy alone. Somewhere in space, there is a solar system like ours, where life exists. Perhaps it is in the constellation Epsilon Baoutes, where a sun is dying, burning itself out. Eons ago, the dying sun would have threatened all life on the second planet of the solar system. Some scientists believe that a space probe was sent from that planet toward the Earth. They believe the probe sent these signals in 1927. Duncan Lunan of the British Interplanetary Society has interpreted the signals as a message from the space probe, a message from a dying planet in Epsilon Booties. Duncan Lunan. What occurred to me was that the uh, stars, the stars are spaced at random in the sky, therefore the coordinates of a star map expressed numerically would be a random series of numbers. There are seven dots in the barrier and there are six dots on the right hand side here and they have quite a marked resemblance, very marked indeed, to the, the constellation figure of Bootes, the herdsman. These sharp lines of uh, intense, rapidly uh, repeated echoes uh, appear to be of the nature of clues, as it were, to the interpretation of the, of the panel. It's like these sort of children's puzzles where you join up the dots and you make a shape so that you could sort of take it like this. It start here. We come from Epsilon Bootes, which is a double star. And then we have this interesting sort of swallow-like shape here. And it says, therefore seems to say, we live on the sixth planet of seven. Well, two signals later, we get an absolutely explicit statement 
in another scale figure that, that they came from the second planet to the sixth. They've got a whacking great arrow pointing from the second planet to the sixth with a sun dot at the, the front end of it. The sun, in other words, it says the, the sun pushed us from the second planet to the sixth. And, it, and just in case we haven't got the point, it's repeated in exactly the same way two signals later. The signals are the only known message from space. In the sequence of sounds, Duncan Lunan has found a specific message of a population moving from the second planet to the sixth in Epsilon Bautes. And then where? Perhaps to Earth. The signals are an SOS to the universe. In this situation, the inhabitants of the planetary system would find themselves in uh, real danger. They, uh, their, their own planet would get hotter in time, all the planets would get very hot. Um, they, were, they would have, in other words, to perfect first interplanetary and then interstellar travel in order to, to get away from the sun. So the probe then came to the Earth, it came to the solar system, it located the Earth, it came into orbit around the Earth and it began looking for uh, signals, radio intelligence signals from Earth that would indicate the presence of intelligence. If Duncan Lunan's interpretation of the signals is correct, a space probe is now traveling in our solar system, monitoring life on Earth. It may already have been seen by American astronauts. Hi, Gemini 7, are you with 98? Loud and clear. 7, go ahead. I'm at 10 o'clock high. This is Houston. Say again, 7. So we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. Roger. Gemini Control here again. The reference in that conversation was uh, bogey. It was uh, Borman who reported citing the bogey. Uh, this is Gemini Control Houston at uh, four hours, 24 minutes into the flight. Bogey is the code word for an unidentified aircraft. But a bogey in space is almost beyond belief, or is it? peak hours, the skies over the United States are filled with as many as 100,000 aircraft. They are watched continuously by the best trained, most skilled radar operators in all the world. To them, UFOs are a daily occurrence. NORAD, the North American Defense Command, for example, reports 800 UFOs on radar every month. Most, of course, are eventually explained, but not all. Almost 400 sightings are still carried on the books as unidentified flying objects. <whistles> 400 reports of airborne objects which cannot be identified give a clear indication that the Earth is being monitored, watched by a presence from somewhere else in the universe. To an incoming space probe, the solar system is unknown territory that must be charted and searched for evidence of life.
Assume the technology of reaching thousands of miles per second had been accomplished, that the problems of acceleration and deceleration in space had been overcome. A probe would then enter the solar system from its most distant point, past Pluto, three billion miles from the sun, and lacking atmosphere, past Neptune and Uranus, too heavily laden with hydrogen and methane to support life. To ring Saturn, awesome, beautiful, protected by a band of asteroids, but with an atmosphere of helium, hydrogen, methane, and ammonia. Verdict, no life. Ahead on the journey lie the most probable planets where life might be sustained. Banded Jupiter. Atmosphere, hydrogen, helium, methane, ammonia. No life. Mars. Distance from Sun, 142 million miles. Diameter 4,200 miles. Atmosphere, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, argon. Probable life. Mars. Life potential close-up survey. Planetary atmosphere thin. Water present in small quantities. All life forms designated primitive. Existence marginal. No life form on Mars is capable of sending electronic signals into space. No, if there is intelligent life in this system, it must be on the third planet, the blue world called Earth. The moon is a perfect vantage point from which to study the Earth. Only a quarter of a million miles away, the explorers could keep a close watch on the blue planet. The moon is different from the Earth and clearly was not torn from it, as many scientists once thought. We have found minerals in abundance on the moon. Minerals that are extremely rare on Earth, yet they are vital to successful space voyages. Plans to mine them have already been drawn by NASA and private industry. One theory holds that explorers from outer space have already mined the moon, pulling from it such minerals as titanium, a metal essential to space technology. It is unfortunate that we can no longer afford to explore the lunar surface, for it is just barely possible that somewhere on the moon are the traces of previous explorers. If travelers from outer space were seeking an exploitable planet in our solar system, the moon would become the jumping off point for their explorations. There are those who believe it has already happened. Duncan Lunan. It's possible that uh, in the course of our history and in the last uh, 13,000 years that uh, ships from Epsilon Botus have come here, have uh, conducted survey missions, possibly even had sm uh, small settlements established here for a time and pulled out again. We have evidence that a landing was made in the Andes near a lake called Titicaca. From the shore, the outline of Titicaca has no pattern. Only when viewed from space does it take on the shape of a jaguar about to pounce. In the ancient language of the region, Titicaca means stone of the jaguar. Was it named by arriving space colonists? An arid mesa called the Altiplano fringes Lake Titicaca. On the barren, windswept plain, the air is thin and corn does not grow. It is a harsh environment. 
Yet there is reason to believe that here, long ago, Earth Base One was established. Earth Base One, a starting point in a new world, a place to practice such advanced technologies as planetary and biological engineering. Most of the traces of Earth Base One have been obliterated. The Inca who dominated this part of the world erased the histories of the regions they conquered. But in the mounds, rubble, and broken walls of an Andean plain lie the ruins of a once great city called Tiwanaku. It stands mysterious and unexpected at 13,000 feet above sea level. It might have housed the most advanced civilization of ancient times. Long before the Inca arrival, Tiwanaku was a reality. And the question arises, how much did the Inca take away in plunder and how much in technology? The Inca did not build Tiwanaku, nor did the ancestors of Indians who now live on this desolate mountain plain. Despite years of study and analysis, scientists are still unable to date these ruins. Estimates of its age range from 1,200 to 15,000 years old. But 15,000 years ago, man was still using flint tools and had not yet developed agriculture. The monolith tells its own story of Earth Base One. In 1927, the carvings were interpreted as an account of the Earth's original capture of the moon. The theory was dismissed as nonsense. But at the close of the Apollo program, there has emerged a similar theory that the moon has wandered through our solar system only to be captured by the Earth. mysteries at Tiwanaku, none looms quite as large as a monolithic archway called the Gate of the Sun. Cut from a single block of andesite, it weighs at least tons. No one knows how it was transported or what tools were used to carve the mysterious figures that run across its face. For the carefully chiseled lines depict birds that never flew in the skies above the earth. A record in stone that we cannot read, except for one intriguing feature, the eyes, which form a part of still another creature, figures barely discernible but nonetheless familiar to us as space-helmeted astronauts. No less mysterious are the eyes of the god atop the arch. Two tears are deeply etched into his cheeks, and no one can say why the sun god of Tiwanaku weeps. And so it stands, a brooding, mysterious ruin atop a desolate mountain plateau, 13,000 feet in the air. Was it built by those who came to make a new home of planet Earth? 300 miles away, on another plain, lie the strange lines of Nazca. From ground level, the lines are very shallow scratches, barely four inches deep. Yet they have remained intact for thousands of years. No wind blows across the plain. No rain washes away the marks. Whoever drew the lines knew they would remain. The plain is in effect a giant permanent blackboard, readable only from the air above. It was designed for incoming alien explorers. It may still serve the same function. April 15, 1966, a television cameraman filming a commercial in a helicopter saw and filmed something that has still not been explained. sightings. 
April 2nd, 1966, a Melbourne, Australia businessman photographed an object hovering in the sky. April 18th, 1965, a small metallic object buzzed the ground south of Albuquerque, New Mexico. are only four inches deep, and yet they remain unblurred by the passage of 2,200 years. Nazca serves as a critical link between Earth and outer space. The lines are a route map pinpointing sites of mystery all over the world. One line pointing east leads to a remarkable unexplained artifact 300 miles away. Someone built Sacsayhuaman, a megalithic fortress in the Andes. Who and why is a mystery. At one point, the Inca used Sacsayhuaman as a base. According to legend, Inca kings thrust their fists into the depths of the snake chiseled into the stone. From it, they received a special power. A compass needle thrust into that same snake head will spin wildly, for the stone is heavily magnetized. How did the Inca, who knew nothing of the forces of electromagnetism, select this one stone of all the thousands of others that compose their fortress as the magic stone of the snake? We do not know, but one thing is certain. With that special power, their empire spread from the Pacific coast to the Amazon jungle. The Inca knew nothing of the wheel, and yet their roads are still in use today. They had no alphabet, yet we are asked to believe they developed an engineering technology that built structures such as this. Or did they? Were they creators or inheritors of a civilization transplanted to the Andes from somewhere else? Sacsayhuaman is built of enormous blocks of stone cut and beveled to fit together with micrometer accuracy. No one has even a clue as to how these blocks, some weighing more than 100 tons, were quarried, shaped, transported, and set into place. Thirty-five feet underwater and 1,000 yards off the northern shore of the island of Bimini in the Caribbean there is another wall. There is absolutely no indication of who might have built it, but the huge blocks bear a striking resemblance to the masonry of the Incas. Some scientists claim it is a natural formation and not a wall at all, but if ocean currents cut the stones in the sea bottom, did they also cut them at right angles to each other? The Bimini Wall is but one of many mysteries in the Caribbean region, known as the Bermuda Triangle. Here, ships and planes vanish under circumstances that defy all logical explanation. Just after the close of World War II, 
In December 1945, five Navy fighter planes vanished without a trace, leaving a mystery that remains unanswered today. Their disappearance has been the subject of a 25-year investigation by magazine reporter Art Ford. Well, a routine naval air patrol took off from the Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station. Five planes, 14 crew members, five different radios. After the planes were in the air a few hours, they vanished. Five radios did not give a coherent reason why they vanished. The men were never seen again. No wreckage of the planes was ever found. There was no radio contact after they were lost. A search plane went up after them with 13 men aboard with every bit of equipment necessary to find them. It vanished within seven minutes. Particularly significant in the case of the missing planes was the uh, radio transmission report that remains in the record in the archives in Washington. Lieutenant Robert F. Cox was flying out to try to find Flight 19. He said on the radio, what is your present altitude? I will fly south to meet you. And Taylor, who commanded Flight 19, replied, don't come after me. He was warning his fellow uh, flyers who were trying to rescue the plane, which they thought was lost. And he said, they look like they're from outer space. Don't come after me. On March 5, 1918, the USS Cyclops entered the Bermuda Triangle. A coal-carrying cargo ship, she had a crew of 309 officers and men. The British liner Vestris reported that she'd heard a radio signal from the Cyclops, indicating weather fair and clear. The Cyclops was never seen or heard from again. No trace was ever found. Ten years later, in 1928, the liner Vestris also disappeared without a trace. Proteus, the sister ship of Cyclops, disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle between November 23rd and December 10th, 1941. She was carrying a cargo of bauxite. Like Cyclops, no trace was ever found. January 8th, 1962, an Air Force KB-50 air tanker disappeared in clear weather. No trace of the plane or its eight crewmen has ever been found. More than a hundred ships and airplanes have been lost in the Bermuda Triangle, taking with them 1,000 lives. There is no explanation for the disappearances that have taken place in clear weather and calm seas. Is this the corridor to outer space? Did the first colonists plant a homing device, a navigational aid, under these waters? A beacon for spacecraft to home in on that somehow interferes with our own navigational devices. January 16th, 1958. An Air Force officer aboard the Brazilian ship Almirante Saldonha sighted a flying disc that hovered over the water for 30 seconds and then sped off. January 13, 1967, a UFO was photographed as it dove and climbed above the Louisiana bayous.
were these and other UFOs homing in on the Triangle Beacon? Is this a marker signaling arrival at the mysterious Tropic of Cancer? It is a line that circles the globe, touching in turn all of the places where a colony planted on Earth might have taken root. India, Egypt, the Canary Islands, the Bermuda Triangle, and finally, the Yucatan Peninsula. The deep jungles of Central America make an ideal hiding place for a colony cut off from its home planet. To this day, the steaming, malaria-ridden lowlands of the Yucatan Peninsula remain largely unexplored. Yet this is the home of the most mysterious people on Earth, the Mayans. We are asked to believe that the Mayans were simple farmers, but no logical reason exists for them to have planted crops on the most difficult of all land. No, the Mayans came here not to farm, but to hide. No records tell where they come from. No evidence explains where they have gone. Only citadels like Ushmal stand to remind us of a people markedly different from any other race on Earth. A brilliant civilization grew and flourished in absolute isolation, seeming fearful of contact with other people on Earth. Priests were the repository of all Mayan knowledge. They alone possessed a secret language, distinct from that used by the rest of the people, a language they brought from somewhere else and jealously preserved. There are many other indications that they are not of the Earth. We know of their advancements. They developed mathematics to a high art. They invented the figure zero. They developed a calendar so exact, our modern astronomical devices have improved upon it by only 17 seconds out of an entire year. They also had a calendar which accurately measured a 260-day year, obviously not a year on Earth. Perhaps it is a year on the planet from which they came. Mayan pyramids may have been the first in the world, the models for all the great pyramids. And here too we find connection to outer space. The very shape of the pyramid gives a clue to the secret of immortality. An enterprising young physicist, Dr. Patrick Flanagan, interprets the link. Strange things that happen inside the pyramid, but no one was able to pinpoint what these forces were. And my research for the last three years has been on pinpointing these forces and discovering what the effect is. I've discovered that the pyramid is sort of a cosmic greenhouse. By this, we know that the uh, pyramid shape is designed to intercept certain cosmic energies from cosmic particles in the same way that a greenhouse is designed so that the sun's rays will will enter the greenhouse at a right angle in order to effect maximum transfer of infrared energy into the interior of the greenhouse the walls of the pyramid are designed for maximum transfer of this energy bioplasmic energy or biocosmic energy whatever you want to call it and certain phenomena incur in the pyramid uh, grains of wheat found inside the Great Pyramid in containers or in the floor, uh, 5,000 years old, uh, sprouted immediately. Also, my own research indicates that 
uh, for instance, plants such as uh, mung bean sprouts mummified in the pyramid are capable of growing after they have been dehydrated. So this indicates that the pyramid energy phenomena uh, maintains the actual life forces within the, uh, within the organism. Beyond the possibility of immortality inherent in the pyramids of the Maya, it is possible that they inspired the sudden unexplainable leaps made by other ancient civilizations. They may have shared their highly advanced knowledge of astronomy with others, for example, the Babylonians. We have found cuneiform tablets that mark the phases of Venus, the four moons of Jupiter, and the satellites of Saturn. None of these bodies or events can be seen without a telescope a device invented 3,000 years after the tablets were carved. The knowledge must have come from outer space. Throughout the world, there are references to interplanetary travel. To some scholars, the world's oldest source of wisdom is in India. This chant is part of a spoken encyclopedia called the Veda. It is at least 5,000 years old and may represent the oldest body of technical knowledge known to man. The references to space travel are direct. Clear descriptions are given of the craft that was used and the method of propulsion. The Veda, committed to paper 400 years ago, is still the target of intensive research by scholars such as Padmasri Sivaramamurti, the director of the National Museum of India. In ancient India, as all over the world, they had a desire to travel in the sky. We have the aerial car of the god of light Surya mentioned in the Rig Veda itself. We have also the Pushpaka Vimana, the wonderful aeroplane that could carry any number mentioned in the Ramayana a real aerial car managed by an engine. The rishis could transport themselves to any planet that they wanted because of their Siddhi. A force known as Siddhi might also have been called pyramid energy. Using this force, the ancients could transport themselves anywhere on Earth, into the skies and finally to other planets. And did the Mayans use it to link together their cities? If the tales and images of space travel were limited to India, they could be dismissed as the product of overworked imaginations. But how then could we account for primitive drawings in the rocks of Indio County, California? In the 20th century, we accept the existence of spacecraft. What event could possibly have inspired this 14,000-year-old drawing of a spaceship landing on the Earth? On a rocky plain in the Andes called Toro Muerto, hundreds of petroglyphs depict the same scene. We find evidence of past visits from space in many parts of the world. The 2,200-year-old Dead Sea Scrolls found in the caves of Qumran bring us closer to the original Bible than any other source and contain clear references to the Holy Ones descending from the heavens. While biblical scholars study the scrolls for their theological implications, other scientists have looked to the Bible for evidence of extraterrestrial visits. An aerospace engineer at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, Joseph Blumrich, has found in the visions of Ezekiel a technical description of a spaceship. The prophet Ezekiel describes four encounters with spaceships. At first he saw clouds, fire, and he heard noise coming out from the sky, out of the north. And as they approached, apparently it came rather quite in his direction. He observed what he calls living creatures. What Ezekiel calls the living creatures had straight legs and round feet or calves feet, sometimes they're called. 
and it was the description of these landing lakes that made me take the book of Ezekiel serious from an engineering point of view. I have had the opportunity about 10 years ago to work with my group, my office, in the, for the development of such a landing gear for an unmanned lunar landing stage. For that uh, hypothetical vehicle, we developed the landing gear and what we call the foot pan and what Ezekiel would call the round feet. Translating Ezekiel into engineering terms, Mr. Bloomrich had these artist sketches made of a landing vehicle supported by four helicopter units. One of the interesting examples of Ezekiel's ability to observe and to describe are the faces he sees on these living creatures. What they actually are is quite interesting. Some helicopters, and particular in this case this one, needs protection, just some hood around to protect them against dust or weather and so on. They may have the distinct appearance of faces. The faces found in the metalwork of spacecraft may have been the figures reported by Ezekiel. The biblical tale is hardly an isolated example. Are ancient figures with spacesuit-like costumes the record of beings actually encountered? And where do the Indians of Colombia find models for these golden helmeted figures sculpted more than 1,000 years ago? The same people molded these golden objects which look startlingly like a modern Delta Wing jet fighter plane. Could flight have played a role in the construction of this rocky fortress in Peru? Called Aliente Tambo, it spans a pass through the mountains that link the jungle with the sea. The Inca builders were accomplished stonemasons who built a chain of fortresses across the Andes. But nowhere is there an explanation for the technology used to carry enormous pink slabs, each one more than 60 tons, from this mountain where they were quarried, and then 10,000 feet up the face of Ollante Tambo, what else but flight could account for raising the stones to the mountaintop? An iron pillar was forged 1,700 years ago in India. It confounds the laws of metallurgy. Too large to have been forged in one piece so long ago, it is rust-free after 1,700 years. The bead is turquoise, another extremely hard gemstone. It is 1,700 years old and was probably part of a necklace or bracelet. The hole in each bead has a diameter of 0.19 millimeters. Even today, we can barely drill holes that small. The strangely knotted strings are called quipu. No one today can read them. But when the Spaniards first came to Peru, the Inca kings would call upon their rememberers who would consult the quipu and account for every kernel of corn and man, woman, and child in the empire. But the quipu were more than a numerical accounting system. For with it, an accomplished rememberer could call forth epic poems, historical dates, and events. The knots show how the decimal system was used in the quipu, but added to them were colored threads that offered subtle nuances and shades of meaning that are forever lost to us. So sophisticated was the quipu, however, that some investigators believe it was the Inca version of a computer punch card. An enormous crystal was placed in a Mochica grave more than 1,500 years ago. It is among the hardest of all minerals, yet it was cut, polished, and shaped by a technology that theoretically could not have existed at that time. Other hands carved this skull, 
The British Museum calls it 15th century Aztec. But why would the Aztecs, who never created naturalistic art, suddenly render in crystal a skull? It is possible that the Mayan jungle strongholds provided the knowledge that advanced the civilization of all of the people on Earth. No matter where we look, we find evidence of their influence. How else can we explain a 700-year-old transplant of a rust-free iron tooth found in a Peruvian grave? It seemingly is as functional as any modern dental prosthesis. Other graves yield the suggestion that the ancient Peruvians were accomplished neurosurgeons. At the Cusco Archaeological Museum, Dr. Fernando Caballesas, professor of neurosurgery at the University of San Marco, demonstrates. These skulls here uh, are a, uh, just a very small sample of the tremendous amount of skulls that were found in the uh, graves of the ancient Peruvians. I think that uh, all in all, we have studied more than 10,000 skulls that uh, have been unearthed. Now, these are some of the instruments that they used. This is called the Tumi, Tumi knife which was used this way, just to open the scalp. This cannot be used in the bone. They used to open the bone, bronze instruments like this, just to pry up the bone, like here, prying up the bone. There are some other odd instruments like this, just to, to make these indentations. And there are at least two different, uh, two dozen different uh, other instruments that were used also. This one here is a very interesting specimen. It shows a very persistent surgeon. You find here that this man suffered four operations, and he survived every one of them. Either it was a very sick man or, or a very persistent individual who operated on them. But he was a very good technician because after all, these areas, especially these two openings, are right over very, very dangerous sites that even right now, with all the techniques that we use now, we would just be very much afraid of operating in these sites. And this man really survived these operations in Calca near here, near Cusco, where about, I would say, 85% of these skulls show healed trephanations. 85% of survivals from skull operations is a pretty good and excellent uh, result. At the Yerkes Regional Primate Center, Scientists implant monkeys with electrodes. The experiment stimulates the brain with radio waves and thereby controls behavior. Are today's scientists seeking knowledge already gained by similar experiments performed centuries ago? of any zoo provides us with a great deal of fun. But occasionally our laughter is accompanied by an uncomfortable feeling. We're not too different from the apes. With them we share common blood groups, a similar anatomy, and perhaps a billion or more years ago, a common ancestor. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
Over here. Throw it here. Come here, monkey. Over this way. There you go. Throw it here. Throw it here. Hey, over this way. Come on. Sometime in the distant past, the links between man and ape were snapped by an event that forever changed the course of our evolution. But no one knows exactly what took place. <laughs> For thousands of years, Neanderthal was the most advanced primate on Earth and a logical ancestor of man. But Neanderthal suddenly disappeared 35,000 years ago, and now a new creature appeared, Cro-Magnon. Suddenly, he began to walk the Earth. We are his descendants, and it is possible that he arrived from outer space. Could evidence of Cro-Magnon's arrival be found at Tiwanaku at Earth Base 1? On the walls are heads, giving to an ancient temple the same feeling as a modern-day anthropological museum. The faces show a bewildering variety of shapes and expressions. Some are familiar, others alien, a range that covers the racial spectrum of man. Are these then experimental designs for man? How could life have been transported to Earth from outer space? Certainly in a universe 13 billion years old, there was time enough for uncounted species to rise create civilizations and scatter them across the universe, reaching even the small out-of-the-way planet called Earth. Dr. Leslie Orgel is a biologist at the Salk Institute in California. He and Nobel Prize winner Sir Francis Crick developed the theory of directed panspermia, the idea that life on Earth was sent here by a superior civilization, Dr. Orgel. In the 19th century, there were two theories about how life could have got to the Earth from outside. One theory, which was due to Lord Kelvin in England, said that life arrived as a spore carried on a meteorite. And the other theory, which was popularized by Arrhenius in Sweden, suggested that a spore could have been blown directly from a planet on another solar system all the way to the Earth. Now, in the last 10 or 20 years, it's become more and more clear that these theories just won't work, that a spore coming from outer space would be destroyed by radiation long before it got here, and um, a meteorite probably could never escape from another solar system. Now, directed panspermia is a sort of last attempt to resurrect the theory that life could have come here from elsewhere. And the notion is that maybe life was deliberately sent here by a technological society on some other planet, probably in our own galaxy. Spaceships would have to spend hundreds of years in flight. To transport and sustain life over such an extended time, space-traveling civilization would have to ship an entire colony of men across a galaxy in suspended animation. Did it happen in the past? Was this the secret of early space travelers? We now know how it might have been done.
The method is called interspecies embryo transplantation. It was developed here at the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology by Dr. M.C. Chang. In 1952, Dr. Chang took a number of fertilized eggs from the womb of a rabbit and carried them to England. There the eggs were implanted in the womb of another rabbit where they came to term. The offspring in turn became pregnant. Their fertilized eggs were then taken from England and implanted in the Worcester rabbits. The Worcester colony is now composed of the descendants of that first embryo implantation. Some just like this, then put into the test tube. So I put those rabbit's egg into those tubes and put into a flask and bring back, and then transplant those. By reaching into the heart of this cell, scientists are challenging our traditional concepts of life and morality. Yet faced with the threat of extinction, a species capable of finding its salvation in an advanced biotechnology would surely seize the opportunity. I think it's possible to transport a human eggs from one, pla one planet to another planet. Our own biotechnology has made of the rabbit a container in which entire herds of cattle, flocks of sheep, and other animals are shipped around the world. At the Wayne State Medical Center in Detroit, Dr. E. S. E. Hoffes has just received a rabbit from South America. It carries embryonic additions to his colony of research monkeys. The idea of embryo transfer is to obtain large number of embryos from one species and ship them to another part of the world in a easy species like the rabbit. Now, we have a rabbit here and we'll have 200 embryos of monkeys in them, in this one rabbit. The first step of this is to how to collect the embryo. This is requires surgery. It's going in the lumen, which is very good. Mm -hmm. It's a very good standard. Then examination of the embryo under the microscope. And then the transfer of the embryo into another species. And then we will go to the monkey and transplant the monkey embryos that were put in the rabbit into this monkey. I don't like to put any air bubbles inside at all, so just we'll learn. Uh... And I think this is ready to go to the colony.
A colony of cells lives in the bottle. The red fluid in which they float is their food. Tissue cultures such as this have supported colonies of the same cells for more than 50 years. In the same manner, a colony of fertilized human eggs or embryos might be kept alive during the long journey between the stars. Periodically, several embryos would be implanted into female crew members, be born, grow, and take their place in the crew, caring for the embryo colony that would one day be planted on a new world, light years from their home planet. In just such a fashion, a rocket might have crossed the reaches of open space and brought to Earth an embryonic colony destined to become the ancestors of men. commemorate the arrival of life on Earth. All over the world, men have cut, shaped, and gouged the Earth to create images that could only be seen from the heavens. The more we understand the progress of modern science, the more we must re-examine the accomplishments of the past. The ancient Egyptians built an incredible complex of temples that were in reality astronomical observatories. The temple of Amun-Ra, the sun god and creator, is aligned so that its axis points directly to the sun at the moment of the midwinter solstice. The temples of Mut and Kansu the consort of Ra, form an axis that points to the crescent moon that rises the day after the summer solstice. Egyptian astronomy was both practical and spiritual, for it allowed them to predict the annual flooding of the Nile and thus know when to plant their crops. But more important, the temple lines could be followed directly to the sun, the source of immortality. To the ancient Egyptians, death was but a doorway that led from a life of insignificance to eternal life. And so the Egyptian pharaohs crossed from Karnak, on the east bank of the Nile, where the living dwelled, to the west bank, where they entered the city of the dead. Once within the city of the dead, the pharaoh was prepared for a journey into space. In light of present-day knowledge, the ancient Egyptian art of mummification seems an echo of modern-day preparations for space travel. The Egyptians believed that two spirits remained with a man after death. The second spirit, the Ba, was the space traveler. Each night the Ba left the body and traveled with the sun through space until it returned to light the world again. To the ancient Egyptians, the Ka and the Ba were not abstract disembodied ghosts, but real entities, and they required a place in which to dwell for all eternity. The burial tombs of the pharaohs were therefore far more elaborate and more richly decorated than any of the palaces in which they reigned during life. The death rites of the Egyptians may well have been imitations of an event they had been told of or witnessed, the preparations for a real voyage into space.
the pyramids were more than mere tombs for the dead. The Great Pyramid of Cheops is an almanac that measures the days of the year, the circumference of the earth, and the distance to the sun. The Egyptian pyramids have been studied by many scientists, but the great breakthroughs have been made by physicist Patrick Flanagan. His studies have shown the peculiar function of the pyramid and its relationship to immortality. It's very possible that the Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed by a race of scientists having far superior knowledge to our own. The fact that the Great Pyramid is level over an area of 14 acres within one half of an inch and is the world's most accurately aligned building to true north and the fact that it incorporates higher mathematics in its very design indicate that a superior race designed the Great Pyramid now, when we ask why, is there a possibility, for instance, that the Great Pyramid is some kind of space beacon? Well, this may be very possible that the Great Pyramid is some kind of beacon, a uh, homing beacon for uh, spaceships. Uh, this possibility exists due to the fact that even with our most powerful radio telescopes, we have been unable to detect any kind of communications going on in outer space and yet UFO sightings indicate that there is activity in outer space. Therefore, the UFOs must be using another form of energy to communicate by, and it's very possible that the energy phenomena associated with the pyramid is the energy used for communications by UFOs. It's very possible that pyramid energy could be used to preserve tissues over extended period of time such as uh, on long space travel or for preserving uh, tissues for cloning purposes uh, for future cell regeneration. The pyramid's phenomenal ability, or the pyramid energy uh, ability to mummify food uh, so completely with no destruction of the tissue indicates that it would be a very viable natural source of uh, preservative energy for cloning purposes or for uh, for preserving anything any cell structures for uh, an extended period of time and so for thousands of years the mummified body tissues of the pharaohs rested near the pyramids along with an exact record of every day spent on earth detailed diaries why Had Egyptian priests been told that reincarnation of a body was possible if its cells were preserved? The diary would then serve as a coded memory for a new body. Immortality would then depend on the pyramid shape, a form whose beginnings are seen at Earth Base One. At Tiwanaku, Earth Base One, a mound of dirt covers the foundation of an enormous pyramid more than 15,000 years old. At virtually every site of ancient mysteries, a pyramid can be found. In Teotihuacan, a Mayan stronghold, there stands another perfectly aligned pyramid. More than a storehouse of mathematical data, it concentrates biocosmic energy, a force that the Mayans may have used to create infinite life. Today's science is just beginning to understand how it can be utilized. The hope of immortality is contained in a genetic message stored in the nucleus of the cell. When the cell divides, that message, coded in chemical units within the genes, is transmitted to each of the new daughter cells. So long as that message is stored within the cell, it remains alive. And so, too, does the possibility of immortality. In the life cycle of the axolotl, a prehistoric-seeming creature named for the Aztec god of death and resurrection, scientists have found a form of immortality. At the University of Indiana, Dr. Janice Brothers uses the cells of one axolotl to create others, 
exact duplicates that are in every respect identical to the cell donors. The process is called cloning, and it makes theoretically possible the creation of an army of identical creatures with exactly the same physical and genetic features and capabilities. Eggs are collected from a white axolotl. If fertilized normally, the eggs would divide into a number of new, different axolotls, sharing as their one common trait, the white skin color. But these eggs are destined to serve only as carriers, mere biological putty containing no genetic message of their own. The egg nucleus is destroyed. It can no longer be fertilized and develop in the normal manner. It can no longer provide any genetic instructions to the individual that will develop from it. A spotted axolotl embryo becomes the cell donor. Carefully, the nucleus of a single cell that carries the genetic information is teased free and pulled into the pipette. It'll provide all the instructions needed to create a new individual. The nucleus is inserted into the unfertilized egg. One by one, cells from the same embryo can be implanted in host eggs. The results will be clones, a total replica of the creature from which the cell has been taken. Each of the eggs carries the same genetic instructions and will develop into carbon copies of each other, clones of identical axolotls. forth identical spot-by-spot -spot copies of a single parent, a uniform set of clones. Full-grown, each axolotl looms like the prehistoric monsters that roamed the earth during the age of the dinosaurs. But these creatures are so far removed from that time as to be of another world, for they are clones, exact copies of each other. Scientists like Dr. Brothers are opposed to cloning human beings, for cloning creates a rigid mold that will stabilize one form, and that runs counter to the design of human creation and evolution. For only in our genetic variety have we gained the traits needed to survive the changes in the earthly environment, and perhaps also those we shall find on the alien unknown worlds of space. The clone is a biological wonder that may one day enable us to reproduce exact copies of animals and plants needed to perform as yet unknown tasks in an uncertain future. sometimes dim, 
often subject to different interpretations. But somehow the idea persists. The Earth has been visited before and will be again. The question remains, how will we communicate with the visitors? At the Yerkes Primate Center in Atlanta, Georgia, experiments are underway at this very moment to answer that question. This is Lana. She lives in a plastic cage with a computer. Lana can tell the computer to provide her with food and drink. The symbols are abstract, not pictures of real objects. And by using them, Lana is in reality using language as well as any human being. To get beyond the confines of her plastic walled world, Lana tells the computer to open the window. She orders the computer to display motion pictures and slides for her own amusement. But more important, Lana can use the computer to talk to the scientists and technicians at Yerkes. One of Lana's favorite conversation partners is Tim Gill. Tim has a computer panel just outside Lana's room. They talk to each other through the computer. they share is not chimp chirping or English, but a language of symbols called Yerkish. It was designed by Dr. Ernst von Clauserfeld. You have a breakdown of it here, a, br a partial breakdown for all the requests that Lana can use. Please is a marker that tells that the, what is coming is going to be a request. Machine and Tim are two active agents. In the case of machine, there are two activities, giving and making. Giving has a number of objects. One of them would be piece of apple. It could also be piece of banana. If the machine is making something, it can't make a piece of apple. It can't make a piece of banana or an M&M. &M. It can only make a slide, or it can make the window open. Lana forms perfect sentences that communicate specific ideas. She has language in common with Tim. The experiment is not as sterile as it looks. Tim and Lana have developed a close relationship. Can Tim visit Lana, he asks? Yes. Much of Tim and Lana's friendship is based upon proper social behavior, proper that is, in chimpanzee society. And so Tim asks, can Tim groom Lana? Yes. Tim? Of course. <laughs> 
It's not yet Planet of the Apes, but Lana has demonstrated the ability to utilize man's most sophisticated tool, the computer, and his most important intellectual attainment, language. We can learn a great deal from this experiment, for anyone reaching the Earth from the deep recesses of space may occupy about the same position on the intelligence scale relative to us as we do in relation to Lana. But it also means that we have found at least one means of communicating with a totally alien species. Language of symbols carved thousands of years ago is still being deciphered. We know the Mayans left a calendar, one that stretches back more than 90 million years, long before civilized man roamed the earth, and forward in time to a day that will mark the close of a crucial cycle. An inscription tells us that the modern period will end December 24th, 2011 A.D. We may presume that they were computing the length of a space voyage and marking the exact date of return. They may return to seek the fate of the colony left on Earth. Perhaps at Uishmal they will find answers we have never been able to divine. This was one of the last bastions of Mayan society. And here a carving is found, unlike any other in Mayan lore. Clearly a skull and crossed bones. According to legend, it is the death house. And nearby is another structure marked by a procession of turtles, the Mayan symbol for a long life. Did the final experiments at cloning take place here? near the Great Pyramid of Ushmal. December 24th, Christmas Eve, 2011 A.D. On that day, they may return to seek the fate of the colony left on Earth. Perhaps they will settle in the jungle of Ushmal, where, according to legend, Mayan priests talk to their gods through a black, shiny, glass-like rock, an ancient description of a television receiver. We know now how they transported the colony to Earth and what they might have left behind. We have only to learn why they are coming back. Mm.